all of you. And a big thank you to Anurag and his team. It's really a privilege to be here. You know, I was trained as a statistician from an IIT. And uh, then I went to study at IIM Ahmedabad. So I'm an out and out quant kind of a person. You know, a number loving nerd. And people still laugh at me because my idea of relaxation is to do a tough Sudoku at the end of a hard day. And yet, I've spent most of my career creating management con uh, content for leadership and soft skills. So it's a completely 180 degree shift. Yeah. I guess it all turned out OK, finally. But uh, you would have realized that the career was compromised. I never really batted to my strength. A large part of that was, you know, because when my children were growing up, I really didn't have much support in the city. And my husband walked into a career which required him to stay away for long periods of time. I tried every trick in the book to keep my career afloat. So, you know, I convinced advertising agencies to let me do flexi time at a time where, you know, nobody was allowed. So I was probably the first. I started a home office when uh, the term didn't exist. So I really, really, you know, tried uh, everything. And somewhere in this 35 year journey, I think Equally a Different was born, though I actually managed to write it only during the pandemic. And I'm happy to see some of the women who've been uh, featured in the book and who were generous enough to share their stories. I hear the Pali is here, Dhanashri is here, and um, it was a wonderful experience. So equally a different is, uh, you know, about what we can do uh, to see that women, career women, stay the course and get into leadership positions. Because as of now, you know, women are not only underrepresented, underrepresented but they're also invisible, you know, you don't find too many women in leadership uh, positions, in uh, decision making roles, in policy making roles. And even those who are there in their careers will tell you that somewhere or the other, you know, their careers have been compromised. They haven't really achieved full potential. So let me just illustrate this with a chart. Yeah, so this is from Deloitte. Uh, and most companies that were spoken to have charts which are like this, if not worse. So even companies that are, you know, very committed to, uh, you know, doing something in diversity. If you see the entry level, it's almost equal. And then you see the drastic drop. It is absolutely embarrassing. You know, so like I like to say, opportunity is not as evenly distributed as ability because there's no doubt about the ability of these people, but, you know, uh, they haven't got the right kind of opportunities. And I think it should bother all of us because I think all of us in some way or the other are invested in a woman's career, be it as a parent or a spouse or a leader or a colleague or some of us are in HR. You know, I think it should bother us really, really immensely. Because I think in a lot of business forums, you know, there's so much talk of opportunity, the kind of opportunities that India is going to present and, you know, how everything's going to happen here, this is the right place to be, etc., etc. But it'll be a pity and a shame if half our talent pool is not going to get access to these kind of opportunities. Uh, so the professional women I have spoken to, and that's, that's the group that I have, uh, you know, kind of uh, covered, they are equal, like I said, in terms of ability. Yeah, all qualified through the exams and, you know, got through the course, worked really hard. So they're equal on ability and ambition as well. I think it's safe to assume that, you know, uh, they are ambitious and which is why they went through the pain of doing all this pain and pleasure and uh, the hard work. 
but they're different in terms of the challenges that they face, both at home and in the workplace. And they're different in terms of their own conditioning. And we all come from this, you know, very patriarchal mindset. Men and women, everybody comes from this patriarchal mindset. And I've covered a lot of it in the book. So it's a, it's a research book where, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people. There are lots of names you know. So um, there are women there who are very known names, like I have Falguni Nair of Naika and Madhi Puri Booch, who is chairperson of SEBI now. You've got management consultant Rama Bijapurkar. And I've got a lot of women who are just as successful, but maybe not as visible in the media. And then, of course, there are uh, you know, other women who had the potential but somehow couldn't really make it. Uh, and it's a great time really to talk to a lot of people like that because I think the millennials are lucky that for the first time we have a fairly large pool of, uh, you know, qualified women who can tell you what they did right, um, what they could have done better. And, you know, uh, all these insights would be very helpful uh, to the millennials. I've also spoken to leaders, HR people, uh, you know, because a lot of them have handled big teams and so they have insights from, you know, fairly large employee bases. So it's really the book is really, um, you know, the collective wisdom of all these people, plus my own insights from my experience over, over 35 years now. You know, people say that authors must be good storytellers. Uh, I've had the experience, very happy experience of being a good story listener as well. Because it's amazing the kind of stories that, uh, you know, people have shared. Uh, very, very inspiring stories. A lot of them make you angry. A lot of them seem very unfair. I've, I've spent many restless nights just thinking about, you know, some of my, the interviews that I have done but all in all, so many stories of courage and inspiration. Uh, and let me just quickly tell you two little stories that in a way, you know, capture the essence of equal yet different. Um, one is a story that's featured in the book and there's this young woman um, from an IIT. She's a small town girl, family of four daughters, very traditional family. After uh, when she's in the final year of uh, the IIT, she appears for the CAT, which is, I think, most people from the IITs. Now, of course, you, they want to do startups, but earlier, everybody wanted to, you know, appear for the CAT. And then she gets calls to all IIMs except IIM Ahmedabad. I think no mean feat, given that, you know, she had no coaching and no really um, uh, mentoring, uh, given the kind of family that she came from, given the kind of background that she came from. Um, and then suddenly her family said, no, it's time to get married. So uh, she obeyed, but she kept her dream alive. And so marriage and a child later, she uh, went to do the PGPX course at IIM Ahmedabad uh, and made it to the dean's list. So she was on the merit list. So I think it's a great story uh, of courage and resilience, and luckily a story that had a very happy ending, um, but so, so unfair, right? Absolutely unfair. Why do women have to, you know, beg for their success? The other one is something that happened after I published the book, and I was doing a Twitter Spaces conversation, and at the end of the conversation, a woman uh, asked a question, a very young woman, and she said, you know, I want to do MBA finance, but uh, my parents feel that, you know, I should do something softer because uh, if I do something like MBA finance, then it, they would find it difficult to find uh, somebody who is more qualified than me. And they say that I will find it very difficult to manage a home and family. I don't think any man would ever need to, you know, um, answer a question like that, face an issue like that. I mean, men have their own challenges, there is no doubting that. But patriarchy really, you know, puts women at uh, such a huge disadvantage. Uh, 
you know, I've been going around speaking to companies and other audiences. And I'm very happy to tell you that a lot of fathers have, uh, you know, come to me and said, or, or people have written in and, you know, posted on LinkedIn and things like that, saying they are so, they have been so moved by some of these stories that they're very determined to have a more gender just world for their daughters and their daughters in law. So I feel very hopeful that the needle will move a little faster than is expected when you you know look at um, targets for diversity and you know all these estimates saying you know when when will the world become uh, more equitable you know they talk about 2050 and things like that but i think if all of us took it upon ourselves to change things then i'm sure the needle would move faster you know women are wired differently there's no doubt about that and this is very universal so it, it is regardless of, you know, where you're based, how old you are, um, how successful you are, or whichever sector you are in. So let me just share uh, an interesting observation from sport. And this is a man, Matthew Mott is a coach who has trained both male and female teams, cricket teams in Australia. And this is a very interesting observation. So he says the one thing that I've noticed is that if you're talking to a room full of female athletes and you say something you think is quite generic, then every female in the room will think you're talking directly to her. And if you do the same thing in a male dressing room, the players will nod and agree and think that the coach is talking about the idiot next to him. You know, women take feedback very seriously and very personally. And these are the kind of insights that I think leaders uh, would benefit from, especially leaders who are leading um, large, you know, global uh, diverse teams. Because everybody doesn't, people are different. And leadership is all about, you know, managing people, understanding your team, and understanding what makes them tick. And if you don't get it, then I think a leader is at a uh, disadvantage. Uh, so, so that there are differences in, uh, you know, the way women are wired. I think the average man comes through as being far more confident than the average woman. Uh, women are self-doubting. Women are hard on themselves. And there are lots of stories like these in the book. And very, very interesting insights into the female psyche. Uh, the problem is that, you know, all the rules in this world are made for the majority. And so if you are different, if the minority is different, and that's, this is true of all society really, if the minority is different, somewhere there is a perception that they are less equal, which is not true at all. If you understand that equal and different can coexist, then it needn't be like that. And really that is what equally a different is about. Uh, as I like to say, equally a different is what uh, you know, the way women want to be treated and need to be treated, both at the workplace and at home. You know, patriarchy and uh, social conditioning have put a lot of restrictions on uh, women. And, you know, you might think, oh, we are in a large city. And this doesn't happen. Look at the women here. I mean, do they look unequal? Do they look as if, you know, they have been discriminated against? But, you know, discrimination is a big word. But every day, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, women get the feeling that, uh, you know, life is not fair in small things. And sometimes people don't even realize it because it is unconscious bias. All of us are victims of uh, conditioning. So actually the book is, is not a us versus them. It's not a male bashing kind of a thing because everybody is a victim in a way. And, and there are lots of mindsets that need to be unlearned. But because of the restrictions, you know, women make very awkward networkers and negotiators. They make very inhibited communicators. And all these things come in the way of leadership. Again, you know, work-life balance is something that only women are asked. You know, how will you manage? Are you planning to have a child? And, and you, you can sense the anger in women when, you know, all these things are asked. Uh, I mean, I can understand organizations need to do resource planning and all that. But there are, there are better ways to do it, probably. 
But I, so you know, work-life balance is a big reason why women women's careers get aborted or compromised at least, if not totally aborted, because it it prevents people from taking on um, taking on challenges. And unless you've done the hard uh, hard uh, yards early enough, you know you become weak candidates for uh, leadership positions. So so that is basically how it is, you know. Uh, women choose predictability over challenges. You know, what can I manage as of today rather than, you know, what's good for my CV or, you know, what, what presents uh, opportunities, where are the growth opportunities coming from. So that is what, uh, you know, this is what I call limiting behavior. There's a lot that good employers and bosses can do because I think they can nudge women to get out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the big, big role, you know, it's not like, what can I do? Everybody can kind of pitch in and, you know, goad them on to take on bigger challenges. But finally, it is the women who need to, you know, uh, shed their limiting behaviors, as I said, and uh, dare to dream big. This, the business world also, I think, has a big role uh, to play in trying to make this world more gender just. And it's not only because um, diversity is on the agenda. Because research has shown that diverse teams are happier teams, more productive teams. They are better placed to take the right decisions and therefore deliver even better financial results. So it's, it's really a business case. It's not, uh, you know, like a lot of people look at it, it's like an HR initiative or a CSR initiative. It isn't. And the earlier people get that, the better it is going to be, apart from the fact that women make up half your talent pool, uh, it, it, it makes great business sense to have uh, uh, you know, diverse teams. And actually, this holds for all of diversity. It's just that my book has focused on um, gender in particular. It's not as if you know, uh, there haven't been initiatives. There have been. Like you know, maternity leave now at a very generous six months. In my time, it was probably a month, month and a half or something like that. Um, then, of course, you have uh, le uh, you know, women on boards. Every listed company is required to have a woman on board, and many, many such things. Most companies have uh, diversity targets. But unless you know, it comes with the culture of inclusion, it's not going to happen, because all these are really compliance issues. And you can only go that far with a danda. Right? Unless you are committed to it, and unless you know uh, that you know certain things need to change, you are aware of you know what is happening. Uh, it's not going to happen. So uh, definitely, you know, you need to have uh, the culture that is um, equal for both the genders. Working late, for example, I don't think is fair at all. Whether the woman works late or her spouse works late. Both, you know, don't work for the woman. And because domestic responsibilities still are being, uh, you know, um, handled mainly by the woman. And so if, if those kind of basic things don't change, then it's not going to work out. And then, you know, women will compromise again on their careers, like I said. And which is why through my book, I have urged all organizations to ask this question, you know, why don't we have enough women here? And this question needs to be asked in every meeting, every forum. Don't leave the room without asking this question so that you know, it remains in the collective consciousness of the organization and you're forced to think about it. So if only you know, your people are talking about sustainability and you know, eco-friendliness and CSR and things like that, why don't we add this to the list? You know, after all, a, a diverse workplace is a very attractive workplace and a more productive workplace. So I think you, you know, one needs to ask this question all the time. Families and societies also have a big role because you know, as of now, we don't have the infrastructure for childcare or elder care. And elder care also is becoming a big issue now with you know, most homes having people who are 85 plus. So if that doesn't happen, so the solutions really have to come from everywhere and everybody needs to do something if this issue is to be handled. One of the leaders I spoke to, you know, actually said that you need to run a diversity initiative like a change management initiative with proper tracking and measurement and all that. 
you know, there is bound to be, like with all change management initiatives, there's bound to be some pushback. Right, because there are many, many questions. Like, you know, do do you need quotas? Do you need reservation? What does it do to meritocracy? How would the men react? Uh, you know, should we treat uh, women as a separate talent pool because we don't want ghettoization? You know, so there are no guarantees. There are no easy answers, but commitment is required. So it has to be a top-down uh, kind of an approach, and therefore we need very courageous and very committed leaders. I don't know, you probably have some leaders here and I hope all of you, uh, you know, would be make those kind of leaders who are committed to kind of making a change. At the end of the day, I think, you know, we are dealing with unconscious bias over here. And that's really, really deep rooted in many ways that you don't even realize and in places that you don't expect it at all. So let me give you a little example. The probability of a man buying a book written by a woman is very small. Yeah, so there, are, there is research to show that. Why do you think J.K. Rowling called her book J.K. Rowling and not Joanne Rowling? That is the reason. So the probability of a man buying a book written by a woman is very small. And if the book gives the impression that it has something to do with women or the subject is about women, it's absolutely, the probability is absolutely minuscule. So, you know, the, I've been getting such a lot of feedback for the book. And one of the responses that has come out very strong and something that I'm very proud about is that people write to me and say, this is book is, I thought this book was about women. It's not about women. It's not only for women. I think every man and every leader must read the book. And if that can be achieved, I think it will be the biggest accomplishment for both me and for Equally Different. Thank you.